Huge. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm Julia, uh, Mauro, third from the top. Um, I'm actually presenting work from myself and most of all of those people. Uh, I'm presenting Bella, a neutral latency audio and sensor platform um, that's embedded as uh, sort of a custom software and hardware environment on a big bone black. And it's been used in the augmented instrument developed and used at the Augmented Instruments Lab at C4DM, Queen Mary University of London. And we've been doing a lot of things with it. Um, I'm going to show you what we did and what you can do with it, probably. Um, um. If you use Twitter handles, uh, thanks. My email address at the bottom. Uh, good. So, you know, when you're trying to interface with the real world, uh, creating a musical instrument or something that's a musical interface, you you have a variety of choices, like you could go to an Arduino and you have some very low level hardware connectivity. Uh, you could try to run everything on Raspberry Pi, that would be much more powerful than an Arduino. Uh, you lose a bit on the, on the, on the connectivity, I guess. Um, and what you get is a full Linux OS, so you know you can store files, get network, um, use USB. Uh, but then your latency is increasing. So what people would do most of the times would be connect an Arduino to a laptop or a computer and get all the power from the computer, the connectivity from the Arduino, uh, but that thing, you know, communication with a serial port, it's bulky, it's too many things to carry around. You get quite a lot of latency, I think you would get, I don't remember the figure just now, it's probably somewhere around 10 milliseconds. Um, uh, or, you know, from when you click a button on, uh, connected to an Arduino to when you actually get something out of your audio system. Um, so, the, the, our platform goes somewhere in between uh, the Raspberry Pi and the Arduino, I would guess, in that you get all the low-level connectivity of the Arduino, you get all the, sort of the same power as a Raspberry Pi, uh, but all of this in a custom software environment that allows you to get much lower latencies than on an Arduino on a Pi. Uh, of course you'd never get you never gonna get the all the performance you would get from a laptop, but uh, still it's probably more than enough for most um, users. Um, so again these are the key features uh, one millisecond round trip audio latency, uh, which is remarkable. Uh, I should say it's we can work with buffer sizes as small as two samples. Uh, at which point most of the latency in the audio would be due to the sigma delta converter rather than to the blocks, um, to the size of the block. Uh, we have eight digital, no, sorry, eight analog inputs and eight analog outputs sampled at audio rate, um, and we also have 16 digital inputs and outputs. All of these sampled at audio rate. Uh, there's digital free alignment between the audio and the sensors, and we still have a true Linux OS at the, bot at the bottom of all of this. So we're using the Zenomai extensions, as we will see later, to get uh, real-time uh, audio performance on, uh, on the Big Bone Black. At the moment you can use C, C++, you can compile pure data patches through heavy. We recently added support for Faust, and there's something more coming up. Uh, yeah, it was designed for musical instruments and for live audio. Again, it's a Big Bone Black with a custom cape, that's a custom Bella cape, gives all the connectivity we mentioned earlier, and also um, on board speaker end. So, yeah, wait. It's, it looks like this. We may want to pass it around. Don't steal the SD card, please. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, Zenomai Linux kernel, Zenomai some real time extensions that allow to give some processes a higher priority than the Linux kernel itself. And that's what happens. So, on the on the Big on Black, there's two onboard microcontrollers that's called PRUs, and they're independent from the main ARM88 core. And what they do is they talk over ISPRC or over SDI to the audio codec or and to the sensor input and output. And all of these happens independently from the main Linux kernel and from the YOLSA drivers, um, which are actually run, running at a lower priority than the audio track itself. Oh, so this is an example of what you can do with it. We just happen to most of the time have um, um, laser cut boxes because we have laser cutters, but you know, 3D printing could be an option, I guess. So this is an air harp, as it's called. Uh, there's an accelerometer inside, and uh, it's driving a carpet strong model. So it's like if you have a pick that's taken down and 
going across uh, an, array, uh, an array of strings like this. Have play. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, but why would you do that, right? So it's embedded, it's relatively powerful, and it's self-contained. That's an example of self-containedness. Um, the, you get very high frequency sensor reading and small blocks, you can use small block size which allows for hybrid feedback loops that are hybrid digital and analog um, and this allows for interactive and interaction and expressiveness uh, and at the same time again you get the full Linux OS and here's a, an action to sign latency comparison with other platforms that would try to achieve a similar goal except for the embeddability. Uh, so with Bella, you can actually press the button and get the sound out in 0.5 millisecond. Uh, Medium Mac would probably, this was testing through Mac's MSD, would get to 5 millisecond. On an iPhone 6, that's actually, sorry, that's actually round trip latency. It was a bit, uh, we, we didn't manage to set up a proper test rig uh, for the iPhone 6 from where you touch it to where you get the sound out. But yeah, that, that should be the idea. If you try to connect Arduino to Macs, on a Mac, then you get uh, around 11 milliseconds latency. And if you're lucky enough, uh, on a Raspberry Pi 2 with pure data, you can go to 19 milliseconds. And I mean, the, the usual acceptable limit, lower limit for latency, it's 10 milliseconds, but you know, drummers can synchronize to a, a beat to up to one millisecond when playing at, with a high, at a high metronome. So yeah, uh, probably 10 milliseconds is, it's, it's a 10 years old, figure that's still in use today, but it's probably a bit uh, optimistic, I would say. Um, what did we use it for? Uh, media research, but also digital music instruments, that's one, we'll see some more later on. Augmented musical instruments, haptic feedback, can be used for sound design, sound installation, measuring tools, kinetic sculptures, teaching, and of course, uh, Alexander's... I, mean, um, I, I thought earlier on that you, know, you, could, you could use it probably for force feed, feedback slides. Sliders, sorry. Uh, you can do all of this, sorry, in C++, pure data using a tool that's called Heavy that compiles your PD patches to some of my C code. And, and then you can use Faust and probably something else shortly. So just to, you know, I need to get engaged. So I'll start with vector graphics, which is something that has nothing to do with what we've talked about so far. Uh, but it's still possible in this platform because you have a fast analog sampling rate, fast computation, and you have touch responsive um, analog input. So I hope you like this video. Oh shit, sorry. Uh, spoiler. Oh, looks like I can't click the link. Okay, let me do this. Good page. try to go back to the slides. Uh, so there'll be something like... Well, actually, I'll go straight to the next video as it's, as it's a video. Uh, so other things you can do, maybe more interesting. So the lightsaber is one of the most iconic sound effects. Everybody knows lightsaber from their childhood and we were especially interested to know what would it feel like to actually handle one in real life. Ben Burt is the sound designer behind Star Wars, and we were obviously very inspired by his approach to designing the original lightsaber sounds. So the way he did it was he um, took the sound of an old-fashioned projector 
and he looped it and played it through a speaker. He then used a microphone mounted on, on a long stick and waved it across the loudspeaker, which then produced this uh, Doppler effect, which is what makes that very uh, unique sound of lightsaber and produces all that sense of movement in the sound. So we took the sound of a TV hum and we looped it inside the patch. We then took the output of this hum and fed it through multiple delay lines. Now these delay lines have a variable delay, so um, we're changing the length of the delay with the movement of the object. And this causes uh, something that sounds very similar to the Doppler effect. And then we... Okay, sorry, I'll cut you there for a second. Uh, you go on with this, right? So you program it to sound in PD, with some restrictions, um, so that all the features are supported by heavy, and then you compile it down and it runs on the board and you can just embed the board on the first thing you find, like a poster queue. Uh, and then, of course, you know, this opens up for modifications, because at some point... Bella, so it's all ready kind of sound. ...that we love our lightsabers and cats, so what if we had a cat saber, and we used the same mechanism of the lightsaber to produce the sound of cats hissing and meowing as you move the lightsaber? And may the power of low latency audio be with you. Okay, that was great, of course. And that's uh, Chris Heinrichs and Robert Jack from the Augmented Instruments Lab. We'll see more about them in a second. Uh, let me just go back to rehearse slideshow with it. Sorry. It's called Play Slideshow. Okay, so that was um, one of the latest things we did with it. But everything started with this one, which is a D-Box, Alex Randall's own one, he's one of the early adopters. And it's self-contained instrument, it's again a laser cut box, two touch sensors at the bottom, at the top, um, uh, embedded speaker, uh, everything you would expect to find on DMI, two piezo pickups, oh yeah, and a, and a sort of patch bay. No, it's not patch bay, it's a, it's a, it's a breadboard, right? So, this is what, this, this thing uses the hybrid analog digital loops, right? So you have a patch bay, but that's actually a digital musical instrument, so <laughs> what's happening there? You can plug in electronic components in the breadboard, and they will affect the way the sound is generated. We can achieve this just because we have this very low latency, um, uh, very low uh, sort of round trip latency uh, feedback loop, and we can send the signal out multiple times and bring it back in, so that techniques that were usually adopted for um, uh, for circuit bending can be used to a digital musical instrument. And the idea here is that the designer will not put, will not constrain the performer in what they can do with the musical instrument, uh, whereas the, which is always often the case for digital musical instruments, but just brings out, uh, brings out some of the interior parts and makes them available for the user to hack. And I should have a video here again, so it would work like, no, 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 no. I need to do this. This and then go to page and then drag the page across here and then maybe it will work. design everything the user can do with your instrument, but the user have uh, uh, some flexibility, uh, much more than you, they would normally use. Uh, you could, don't normally have an additional musical instrument. Uh, another project by Chris that you saw earlier in the lightsaber video, and for designer, uh, which he developed with uh, collaboration with Enzian Audio, is a tool uh, aimed at uh, sound designers for um, uh, musical uh, for, for video games, sorry. 
Uh, the idea is you have uh, a sound model that may sound great, but if you don't have the correct gesture, uh, you will not be able to make some of the sounds possible. Uh, so the idea is to use Bella with an array of sensors, uh, four sensitive resistor, accelerometer, two piezos, and you know you may always need a couple of sliders, uh, and use this to, uh, um, to actually play and perform um, folly sounds, uh, just like just like if it was you know if it was a bag of props that the folly artist brings around. You you play that with Bella. That's one of the things, and the other thing is that you can in a way, record the gesture, and then later the user, uh, for in this case it would be the guy playing the video game, will play back something that, I mean, will, will interact with your pre-recorded gesture in a way, uh, but so that his gesture will still be uh, meaningful and plausible, even though, of course, he can't have the same senses that you have when you generate the sound. Uh, so this is an example of how bad things can go. Can go. Let's see if I can play. So, the sound here is the sound of a motion, like if you were, you know, moving a sword or a stick in the air. But if you have the wrong interface for it, it would just not sound realistic, or would be very difficult to get something of it. And this sound sounds kind of plausible, but you see, it's, it's, it's not the way it's supposed to be. If you connect up an accelerometer, that's when you, you get exactly what you expect. And it's Sorry. Uh, I guess I'm, I guess I muted well. It goes back where it was supposed to go. Um, uh, oh well, I, I, I'll read on the next slide. In the meantime, um, so the bigger bone is good for this thing because okay, it's real time. If you get very low latency and you have plenty of connectivity, so you can connect all these sensors. Uh, but even though it may sound a bit underpowered with respect to what would be the CPU that, that we run the code later, it, apparently in the video game industry, as a audio designer, you're not given much uh, CPU, you're not get allocated too much CPU power. If something is, is overloading the big bone, then you're probably uh, going to exceed the, 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 um, uh, the amount of CPU that's allocated to you. And so, uh, in this case, he's setting up a... Uh, is setting up a force sensitive, sensitive resistor to control uh, a rubber toy, a squeaky toy. Let's hear about it. So again, it's about, it's, not a, it's about choosing the right interface, right? You do this. <laughs> and, you get, and you get something that sounds nothing like, what it, nothing like what it should be, right? But if you just... But, but, but if you just change a bit, and instead of taking the, the value, you take the derivative of the action, the numerical derivative of the value, you get when you... Uh, and this is what I said earlier, I guess. Good. Uh, well, he said that the heavy tool that's used to... Thanks. It's used to compile down the PD patches to sound is actually... can compile to many different platforms. I need to run quickly now. Uh, so this is until Robert Jack with Tony and Andrew McPherson, who's <coughs> the head of all of this, uh, did. And so he put together a simple musical instrument to see how uh, mm, feedback, haptic feedback, can help musicians to play in tune on a continuous uh, touch sensor. Um, different types, so yeah, again, it's an embedded instrument. You see there's Bella there. One of the power amplifiers is used for the loudspeaker. The other power amplifier is used to drive the, uh, the actuator that actually gives the haptic feedback. Uh, it's, it plays exactly as, as you would expect it to, except if I can't play. Okay. Uh, and different types of feedbacks that were given to the to users range from something that vibrates when you're in tune uh, to something that, oh, this is the same slide again. Okay. Something that vibrates when you're in tune, something that vibrates when you're out of tune, in this case, uh, you'll see at the, well, you see at the bottom. Ooh, didn't work. No. Well, doesn't matter really. Um, <laughs> something that vibrates when you're out of tune, something that vibrates uh, that mimics the beatings that you would hear on a, between, for instance, two strings, an open string and a fretted string on violin, something like that. Uh, results are, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, 
results show that that actually improves. Which of the three methods is preferred by the user? That's still to that's still to decide. Um, uh, this is something that I did uh, using sensors connected to BigBoom to record to you know create a BST plugin that takes data via OSC and you can just uh, log your data in the in the destroyed workstation, which is very useful if you need like Rob did for for his instrument that we just saw. You just you just log the data, then you can analyze them later. Uh, something else that I use it for is to analyze the mechanics of the Hammond organ, where you know you have nine switches um, the, between each key, and so if you want to see how those contacts bounce and, and click, then you need to, to have something that gives you accurate, fast readings. I will not show you the video in my setup because it's really lame. Uh, but you can you, you get out something like this, where this continuous line, oh, I can see it, uh, the continuous line here is a key position, and these are the nine switches at the back. And if you zoom in, you want only one of those switches, you can see that you know it closes for a while, then it stays open for another while, and then it bounces, and then uh, until it eventually closes. And these are samples at 44.1, so I don't know, that's a few milliseconds. Uh, very interesting project. This one is by Liam. Um, he does an active stream control. Uh, it looks like this. He has a sensor array, two optical sensors that track the displacement of a string. And then he has a movable bridge uh, with a piezo stack actuator at, at one of the two ends of the string. And this bridge can move by a few less than one millimeter, and it's very expensive. Um, so what it does, it senses the position of the, the displacement of the string at the two points. Then there's an algorithm that can tell it, can distinguish between the wave that's being reflected, that's going left, and the wave that's going right. And applies the delay uh, um, according to when the wave is supposed to get to the to the movable bridge, and, and then it can dampen the string. Uh, this is what happens really. Uh, the is you can, again, you, you move the bridge when the, when the wave is supposed to get there, and you can dampen the vibration in less than one cycle, actually one cycle. And if you could do it with Bella, you could have done it with the Arduino, for instance, because the latency there, the, the sampling frequency is not determined, it's not deterministic, and also because of, you know, uh, uh, not enough uh, power, probably. Other people using Bella, Calico Strum, it's um, it, uh, Dan here, this is not related with our lab, it's some external people, you know. Uh, using it. He presented at the Grafman instrument competition and he can plug the strings, actually the membranes, and he uses it in the sound of the plugged membranes to, to drive a the strong model, I guess. I will skip to the second half of the video. But yeah, you get the idea, right? So it's actually, it's sort of a string interface for keyboard players. He's now using those buttons over there, but you could use the keyboard as well. Uh, something more is this thing that Lewis did. Oh, you, should, you, should, you were not supposed to, you were not supposed to see that. Um, um, <coughs> you can find more examples of this link here. I think this one is really worth seeing. It's very quick. Uh, it goes a bit like this. Again, that's an eight piezoelectric sensors uh, connected to Vela. And I think I'm basically there, except if you want to see the thing you were not supposed to see. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, wait, there's something important here. Um, uh, play, play slideshow. There you go. So, apparently, all of this is on Kickstarter right now. And so you can buy it. Actually, you, you can back us and hope they will reach the target. We already did, actually. Um, <laughs> As in, we are 800% funded, but that's just because the, limit, the initial limit was very low. So, if you want one, go there, and if you have a question, ask me. <laughs> Thank you.